beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense. Hi everyone. Pietra and I got to know each other in 1980, when we were both standard six pupils at Furentu High School in Johannesburg. 38 years later, we are still great friends. For my latest birthday, Pietra invited Jaka and I to join her at her timeshare at Nguenya Lodge for a week of rest and game watching. We gratefully grabbed the opportunity and had the most amazing time. At the same time, I grabbed the opportunity to ask Pietra to talk to us for Meet Me in the Field. She sounded very reluctant, but after I managed to convince her that we harm neither human nor animal during the recording of our episodes, she agreed. What she does not know, though, is that I was not going to let go of this opportunity easily. Fortunately, she agreed without too much poking and prodding from my side. The reason why I really want Pietra to talk to us is because I have seen a significant change in her sense of spirituality over the years that I have known her. And not only do I find her journey really interesting, but I also find the destination very fascinating. She says she is still learning, so let's watch this space. This podcast is supported by the first layer, the 12-step workbook on working through the 12 steps in any addiction in 21 sessions. There's also a 24-day step coaching and counseling program available based on the first layer. For more information in this regard, go to www.freddy.org.za and click through from the notices at the right of the homepage. This is Pietra's story. Sit back and enjoy. Pietra, welcome to Meet Me in the Field. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for the invitation, Freddy. Are you still nervous? No. Oh, cool. I'm so glad you are because there's absolutely nothing to be nervous about, especially considering where we are. Fabulous surroundings. <laughs> we are bordering the Kruger National Park just with a crocodile river between us, and we've been enjoying the most beautiful view over the past week, enjoying the most wonderful holiday. Thank you very much for inviting us on this. Only a pleasure. This for me is, if you talk about spirituality... I've possibly been in my most spiritual place. This has been my kind of church for the past week. Is just just out where it's quiet and where these trees and nature and so many animals. We've seen the most amazing animals in the Krug over the past few days. Well, nature is in a divine order. And I'm not surprised that you experience a very deep sense of spirituality in nature. Um, I do believe that that is where spirituality starts. Ah, we see something. Absolutely. That my, my natura seems to be featuring in your spirituality as well. Now, before we get onto that heavy topic, let us giggle a bit. And that is, we calculated that we've known each other for 39 years now. That is correct, yes. Yeah, so we met when we both went to high school. I confess that I just thought you were the most beautiful girl ever. (laughs) Oh, I'm very flattered. (laughs) I'm extremely flattered. (laughs) Obviously, at that time, just going into puberty, (laughs) you do not have a very good (laughs) self-image. And unfortunately, I had to wait 30 odd years to hear, hear that, that confession. <laughs> oh, my, mother, my mother still still thinks that my, my whole life will turn out completely differently if I just marry you and get it over and done with. <laughs> we shall leave her to live her fantasy. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> She's entitled to that. Absolutely. <laughs> so when I met you, mm. we were a part of the Afrikaans Conservative Christian higher education system. The education system was called Christelijke Hoer Onderwijs. That's correct. Yes. So Christianity formed the basis of our education system. That was the cornerstone, yeah. yes. Did that ever resonate with you? Did Christianity resonate with you at school? I mean, obviously you you grew up Dutch Reformed. I did. Yeah, and so did I. And, and we had to be part of this because we had to be confirmed at the age of 17, I think. That's correct. Yes. Look, it's interesting. At the time, I suppose it did resonate because that was all I knew. Yes. Looking back, I believe that it 
is important for any child to be raised with some sense of religion. Some 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 basis. Some as, basis. As, as some cornerstone. Maybe. Some cornerstone. Cool. So I did. It did resonate with me up to a point, and then things changed dramatically. Okay. I do not condemn Christianity, and cool. I do not condemn that part of my life. I still believe that that was a very important part and perhaps the first step into spirituality. Yeah. So that was your, your sticking your toe in the water. Correct. Now, you said something interesting and that was Christianity was all you knew. But if I think of getting to know you and even in high school, you always had your net cast a bit wider. Mm. And... For instance, this is going to sound weird. It's got nothing to do with really with with religion or spirituality. But you were always quite knowledgeable and very interested in things like Greek mythology. Um, I remember you knowing about the Greek gods and and those type of things, mm. and you knew the stories which I knew nothing about. I still know nothing about. Um, I think I was very blessed in the sense that I was raised by parents that were very open-minded. They used to accept the fact that they had to raise us as Christians because they were both also in the Dutch Reformed Church. My father came from a very conservative Christian family. Was he the one who came from the farm? He came from the farm. Okay, so he's the farming My mother was the city girl and she was raised... Her parents were... If you if you can describe them from a Christian point of view, sinners. They were honest sinners. There was a divorce back in the 40s when when parents did not get divorced. You know, I think her father, in fact, was excommunicated from the church because of the divorce. So she had another approach. My dad was very conservative but highly intelligent and never closed-minded. And my knowledge of the Greek mythology came specifically from my mother because she had a very avid interest in history. Okay. So I grew up in a household where my father was the scientist, my mother was more um, interested in history and languages. So I had a very balanced view growing up. Okay. And I was fortunate enough to have parents that were very analytical. Yes. They did not necessarily accept everything on face value, which had an impact on me growing up and obviously the way I my thought processes through through growing up and 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 a young a, a teenager and then later on a young adult. I think that was also one of the reasons why I was perhaps sometimes regarded with some suspicion. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> because I accepted what was what I was told or taught, but I also questioned it. Although I never really did it out loud. I was never in in my teacher's face yes. about questioning their reasoning or their philosophies yeah. or their doctrines that they tried to impose on us at the time. I think they knew by my writings and the way I sometimes argued matters that I was possibly in a position where I had perhaps more knowledge than what they had. (laughs) And I think they felt quite threatened by the fact that, you know, I was not put into a little box. My parents gave me other tools as yes. well. After all, we were part and of the schooling system where we weren't supposed to think. We were not we were supposed, supposed to, to memorize think. things we, and correct. Get, um, get through school and get the marks on, on the right hand corner of your paper in a red circle and carry on with your life. <laughs> that, that is correct. And, and I think they, in a way, regarded me as a bit of a very strange thing, you know. And, and I think some of the teachers, not all of them, there were exceptions that promoted that way of thinking, but there were some that really felt threatened yeah. by just the mere fact that I had a balanced view. Let's yes. put it that way. Can you recall, with your father being a scientist, mm-hmm. having conversations about religion with him, 
and the the validity of it or anything like that? What, what, was he not, uh, as a scientist, was he not questioning religion? That's basically what I'm asking. Look, I think that religion was hammered into him. Okay. Um, I think it was something that he did not question for a very, very long time okay, in his life. Because it was just not done. It was not done. Yeah. What I did find was that he did question Calvin's reasoning and philosophy. He approached relig- religion in a very intellectual manner. Okay. So to him it was more about the reasoning, the arguments, the, the approach that he got a lot of joy out of or not you okay. know so he went into much higher level the the, the thinking process mm. but i do remember um later on in life my father was aware that i formed a very alternative view and thinking and we had a conversation once about energy because i believe in reincarnation and he we had this conversation about energy And I remember him saying to me as a scientist that as human beings, we are energy. And if we, when we die, his question was, what happens to the energy? It must go somewhere. So he had to question that as a scientist. As a scientist, I think that dawned on him. But I don't think that his very conservative upbringing allowed him, although he was a brilliant man to even go there or to explore the possibilities of that. I think he accepted that as it's your soul and that your soul goes up to heaven, you know, and you will be then judged and you will either then stay in heaven or be condemned to hell. So for him, but that that there was an awakening there. And a realization, I could see that. Yeah, okay. But also, I did not explore that with yes. him for various reasons. Okay. The next thing that pops into my head is I somehow got you, got you in inverted commas mm. for mm. seeing that we're not a live feed. <laughs> you, mm. you won't see my. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, to the listeners, I was inverted comma, comma, hing the got you. I always got the feeling that, that I got you on the level of questioning religion. And then you freaked me out when you started dating a guy who studied theology. <laughs> yes, um, that that also surprised me to a very large extent, and it still does. I mean, love, love can't be explained. Look, it's not about love. It is also about a spiritual journey. And as I've said right at the inception of our discussion, Christianity was the first step wandering into spirituality. Yeah. I had to explore that option uh, to a very large extent. What I did find was that in our specific culture and within the Dutch Reformed Church, that it became a little bit more about the person than the religion. Okay. And that there were very high expectations of anybody who became a preacher within the Dutch Reformed Absolutely, Church. Absolutely, yes. And unfortunately, and I think it's quite a legacy that we carried through from our history as an Afrikaner yeah. nation, that your preacher is put on a pedestal. It's, he's almost regarded as a demigod. Absolutely. Not only that, it, there's a certain status yes. connected to it. And also, you cannot really relax because mm. you, as a demigod, in inverted commas, mm. which our listeners can't see, <laughs> you live a life in a little ivory tower. Yes. So, to the outside world, you have to act perfect. You have the perfect relationship. I've seen it later on because I do have friends that still are preachers in the Dutch Reformed Church. You know, the children have to be perfect. I was going to say, the, the balls up is that it's not just the preacher being put on that pedestal. pedestal it's the you whole family. Do, it's the, the whole family. It's the wife. Brought into it. yeah. It's the wife. It's the children. It's such an expectation. A, a huge expectation. And I have seen them crack under that mm. kind of pressure. 
Is that because they're mind? not allowed to be people to live an authentic exactly. life. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, and I'm not condemning the church at all. Yeah. It's got its place. I just think, and it might have changed a little bit later on in years, but I think that these people, you know, you, normal people should actually relate to a spiritual leader in a very normal manner. Mm. Your spiritual leader is not perfect. Are we are all people. on a journey. Exactly. We are all constantly learning and you learn yes. and you learn and you learn. And you learn by making mistakes. And the only way is yeah. by making the mistakes. So I feel to a very large extent extremely sorry for these yeah. people because I know where they that. are. Yeah. I've been there. I know that you have to have the happy smile all the time. You have to act correctly. You have to be this really Christian example. And it's not humanly yeah. possible. Absolutely. So the thought process that goes from my, my head at the moment is it's nearly as if that relationship gave you a, a, a kind of a, a second toe in the water to explore where you really stand. Oh, absolutely. It was a, you know, I don't believe that anything in life happens for no reason. So that was definitely a learning curve for me in spirituality. Mm. It didn't suit me. It wasn't, I didn't feel completely harbored. I think okay. that's the right word I to like use word, yeah. by the Christian faith. I felt threatened to a large extent. I felt that, you know, you are under a magnifying glass yes. and people are waiting for you to make that mistake in order to throw stones at mm. you. And that is not my belief of Christianity or spirituality. Yeah. It is oh, yeah, about yeah. love. Yeah. But that was that was definitely the first major step, I think, in my journey towards spirituality. Okay. What was the next step? Well, the next step was basically not wanting to have anything to do with formal religion. Okay. And it is to a very large extent still where I am. But having said that, I still do not condemn formal religion. Yeah. Certain people do need those structures. They do need the specific pathology and and doctrines. It feeds their soul. Yes. It's their need. And I can never, ever point a finger at that and say, well, because it doesn't work for me, it shouldn't work for yeah. you. I just found an alternative way to find my own spirituality. Awesome. Yes. Now, over the past week, we've had some amazing, wonderful conversations. Ooh. And we touched on quite a lot of, not really spiritual beliefs or anything. It, it was more kind of just things we do in life. I mean, mm. I read my daily readings and I meditate normally and all those other things. I've been really bad with meditation this week. But I feel sitting in the car looking at animals was a, an amazing way of meditation. Of so, course it so is. I feel just, very just looking at the landscape yeah. and, mm. and just being quiet with an animal yeah. down in the river from where we sit, I think that is a form of meditation. Yeah. And I, I, this week while here I read that book, um, There's an Elephant in My in Kitchen. My kitchen. Yes. And today I we saw so many elephants today. And one of them, right at the end, we saw one really, really close up. Beautiful. And wow. I, it's really as if I, I, I have that kind of a weird spiritual connection with with that animal. Now, you are a, a great animal lover as well. Yes, yes, I You am. had a spiritual connection with your last dog. Yes, I did. And, but that wasn't your first dog, though. No, no. Um, I've always had dogs as pets, and they were all very special. But I was gifted with this dog about eight years ago. He, uh, it's a Great Dane. And I formed an unusual bond with this dog. 
not a bond that I ever expected to form with an animal because it's a domesticated animal. It's supposed to guard your house. It's supposed to keep you company. And sometimes it's an irritation when it barks. <laughs> so, you know, I did not quite... Or steal your dinner from the kitchen. Or, <laughs> which he often did. Um, I lost a, a leg of lamb to him and a few chicken breasts. Yes, I did. But the dog connected with me in a very spiritual way and he was always by my side and the thing about the dog was that when I went through a very difficult time in my life and I had days where I could not get out of bed that dog managed to get me out of bed so he was your strength he was my strength when my troubles sort of reached a climax, shall we say, yes. my dog died. Oh, my word. And I believe that he carried my burdens for me and he carried my burdens very bravely. And when he had served his purpose, he left me. That's kind of the, the feeling that went through my mind as well. It was it was nearly as if he, the, the picture that I had in my head now was he said, I brought you to this point where you can make this difficult decision. Yes. I, I can now go because, because I've, 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 I've got you here. Yes. You're amazing. Yes. 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 I love that thinking. We had, when I was a teenager, I don't know whether you can remember, we had this small little dog called Gina. And yes, she I had um, um, golden retriever blood in her. Yes. And that poor dog, when I was going through my teenage <laughs> drama and everything, I used to pin her down and cry into her chest. Yes. And she would just lie. Yes. Absolutely quietly. Yes. And I would get up and her chest would be soaking wet and she would just be, okay, are you done now? Yes, I'm done. Cool. Where's the food? Where's, where's whatever? It was, yes. She was just such an amazing, amazing pillar for me in my teenage years. So I completely get that, yes. that type of a dog can do that. If you have to summarize what spirit or spirituality or, or spiritual practices are for you today, where would you take us on this journey? Well, I think it is... <laughs> I get is the feeling we're going to cast that net quite wide now. It's going to be interesting, <laughs> exciting times. Let, let me explain it to you. It's, it's like a box of Smarties. So I do not follow a specific doctrine. Cool. But I do take from different doctrines that I believe will serve me in my journey. Yes. You take what you need at that I stage take, in I your take life. I take what I need. So... At this point in time, probably I'm somewhere between being a pagan and a Buddhist. Okay. So, once again, close to nature, your practices are connected to nature. I'm born under the star sign of Cancerian. Okay. And so the moon is my ruler. Ah. Oh, it was full moon this whole week that we were here. Exactly. So, I do certain practices especially when it is full moon okay if i do a cleansing ritual i usually wait until it is the full moon because i feel that that will have a profound effect cool and yes that 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 is one part of it i read quite a lot about that i won't say that i'm knowledgeable because i'm still on the journey of gathering information on that but then also I do believe in tarot cards mm -hmm. and I do believe in psychics I do believe that there are guides placed on your path with special gifts okay and you know somebody once explained it to me that when you visit a strange country it's great to just arrive without a map and without any plan or any idea where you go or which places you're going to visit. But it makes the experience a little bit more profound <laughs> if you have a map in your hand. Yeah. And I would say that tarot readers, and I have been going to two throughout the last 20 years, I suppose, 30 years of my life, have been exceptional in guiding me because they give me the map. How did it happen that you went to one for the first time? I think my sister went okay. the first time and, and she told me about Michael. 
and I then made an appointment to go and see him. And because you felt you needed some guidance. Well, you know, I was very young at the time. You're always interested. Oh, wait, Petra. 20 years ago, you weren't very <laughs> Well, <young>. make it <laughs> 30 years. Let's make it 30 years ago. Okay, fine. Ooh, Ooh time has stood, stood still beach, for me. Beach, beach, beach. Sorry. Bye, bye. But, <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, you, you're young. And, you know, that typical young girl dream about, you know, who am I going to marry? Okay. You know, will I be how wealthy? You know, how many kids will I yeah. have? So it, it starts there at a very innocent so it was a fascination, it was an, an, an intrigue. It was more, yes, I was intrigued, I wanted to find out. and But it took a much deeper meaning eventually. It wasn't about who am I going to marry or how many children I will have. It started to give me a map on a spiritual journey. Okay. Because the tarot can also tell you, you know, you're going to be given choices. It depends ah. what choice you make, which will determine your path. They might warn you about certain incidents, which will have a profound effect on your spiritual growth. So I found that very interesting. It's still not, one must always remember, it's not an exact science. So you will never have a very clear answer. Mm. But you will have a map. Ah. You will have, you can connect the dots at the end okay. of the day. Which now is you interesting. you brought up the question of children, yes. of which you have an, do we call him adult already? I would say, I would call him a young adult. A young adult. Yeah, he's 21. Which, yeah. Yes, yes. As a parent with a child whom you have to give a map to, mm. What do you believe you gave him in terms of a map, a spiritual map, if I can call it that way? Oh God, that's quite possibly a difficult question. No, it's not really, because I did the only thing that I knew how to do, and that was to follow my parents' footsteps. Okay. So what I did was that he was enrolled in a Christian school where Christianity was the cornerstone of the school. It's in fact an Anglican school. Okay. So he was well versed in Christianity. But having said that, it was also a school that promoted debate about other religions okay. and also welcomed other religions into the school. Okay. So he had quite a lot of interaction with other religions growing up. And then also he had a mother yes, I just want that to say, kind of, yeah. was open-minded about other religions. And when I raised him, I made quite a point of it to engage Okay. with him on an intellectual level to throw open certain topics for discussion to have a healthy debate about something and to to promote his way of thinking and his reasoning abilities to develop that to the best that I could and although he then was confirmed as an Anglican he has a very sharp intuition and He's very spiritual, and he reminds me of an Indian warrior. Oh, wow. Because he is a big boy. I was he's built like a brick shitter, so he can definitely be a warrior. He was the rugby <laughs> player, very active growing up. He's tall, he's strong, he's a soldier. Okay, yeah. I think physically one can maybe describe him best in that way, yeah. that he's a soldier. But then, just like an Indian warrior, he also has the intuition and the spiritual side yes. that the, the native Indians would have. Yes. And which makes him, to me, a very, very interesting individual. Awesome. Yes. Cool. Now, something that popped into my head was you work in the legal field. Yes. That's not exactly a field that I connect with spirituality. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you bring to the party in your in your profession? Because what what do we actually deal with in law? Morality. We we deal with morality, but we also deal with rules and processes, and obviously the law. So, what I would bring to my profession is 
perhaps a deeper insight into what is actually happening. Okay. So you see on the surface the conflict. You see the rules that apply. You see the written acts or law that apply to that specific situation. But you also see it in a, on a deeper level, on a more spiritual level. I can almost call it a subtext that's going on. It's okay. like the written word, but there's a subtext going on as well. And it does happen that, especially in my field of law that I specialize in, that you find that people are lost and that they are looking for some guidance. Okay. And although it's not my place to guide them spiritually at all and I will not go there, sometimes the way in which I deal with a matter might make an impression. Okay. Sometimes when there's high conflict, I will go in with a very gentle hand. Okay. And understanding and love. I won't say it, but that will be my approach. Yes. Is to, there's high conflict, there's hatred, you know, st known structures have been demolished, it's been destroyed, families have been destroyed, and people need a new direction they so you help them place new structures in in place and but you do it in a kind and gentle manner sometimes it's not possible the situation might not warrant yeah. it but with patience and slowly guiding your clients into an acceptance of what has happened perhaps sometimes explain to him that there might be a very good reason why this happened. It might yeah. not be clear at the time, yeah. but it might become clear in future. A very, very gentle and okay. a very subtle way to guide them there. Yes, I think that is a contribution that I can make. How can I put this? I think we discussed it this week was that you help your client to see the potential of rebuilding. Absolutely. You know, you show the client that it's a journey. And you show the client that even though there was absolute destruction, that it is part of the cycle of life. Yeah. So something dies and something is born. Absolutely. And it's up to you to start a new life, yeah. to start a new journey. And to decide what you want to take with you on this yes. journey. You can take your history, you know, the destruction with you, or you can take the lessons yes. from that destruction yeah. with you and start a new path in your life. Awesome. I'm going to end with the following question. Your job, the way I look at it from the outside, can be soul-destroying. Not. Yes. You, God, you, uh, you, no. you should have seen the face. Then. I, yes, no. So, it, so what do you do to safeguard your soul? Oh, um, that's quite easy. Oh, cool. You ask for protection. And, and you remain focused on your journey. Okay. It's very important not to confuse your journey with somebody else's yes. journey. Your roads and your paths will cross. And sometimes you will walk a distance with that person on your journey. But it doesn't necessarily mean that their journey becomes your journey or your journey becomes their journey. And sometimes you have to make that decision. That and there's distinction. I, and the distinction that I can no longer aid you. Okay. I have done what I can do. Yeah. I have brought the lesson to the table or you have brought the lesson to my table. Yeah. And this is where our paths will then awesome. go separate ways. And I always lie, it's never the last question. In what way do you learn from your clients? God, I couldn't think what they were. <laughs> the <laughs> guide, so, my guides. Your, your clients. My clients. Yeah. So, because you, as you say, you sit with people invariably in really difficult positions. Mm. And 
you can also use them as guides for for your own journey. And and are you sometimes acutely aware of the fact that that you are learning from this process? You learn every day. And I can't say that there's a very specific lesson that cumulatively that I learn. But I do learn from each and every one of them something very small sometimes. Sometimes I learn just to persevere. Or I learn to walk away. Or I learn forgiveness. Okay. So each of them will bring a small little lesson to the table that I can learn from. And you are open to that lesson, so you do you do take the, le- absolutely, take the lesson. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I do regard that every person that crosses my path in life does so for a very specific purpose. Awesome. Petra, thank you so, so very much. I love this chat. And now I'm going to sit outside on a stoop and look at the water buck lying on the, on the little, what do you call it, island in the river and enjoy a lovely dinner. Thank so you. thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me, my friend. I love you dearly. And I'm very humbled to have been part of your podcast. Awesome. Let's hope we could do this again. No, not the podcast, the holiday. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Coolio, thank you. Bye. Oh, my word. There's actually so much more I feel we should have discussed and stuff that I wanted to get into. The problem is, when Pietra and I get going, the conversation gets a life of its own and we have the potential to never stop. I was acutely aware of the length of our chat because I was afraid of losing all sense of time and not being able to edit our chat into a manageable episode afterwards. I thus kept a very tight rein on the conversation, but in retrospect, I think I overdid it a bit. After this holiday together, we enjoyed it so much that we decided to do it again. So we're thinking of maybe going to Itosha or the Karua National Park next year. I shall then sit it down and do another, more in-depth interview, getting some of her very interesting stories recorded for Meet Me in the Field. Believe me, there are many very interesting stories to hear. If you want to know more about what I do, please feel free to connect with me on my website, which is www.freddy.org.za, or find me on Facebook at either Meet Me in the Field, or Freddy Counselor, or Freddy von Rensburg, or on Twitter at at Rensburg Freddy, or Instagram at Freddy Counselor. Remember that Freddy is always spelt with an IE at the end. I want to thank Pietra for her time and for sharing her journey with Meet Me in the Field. I also want to thank her for a most amazing holiday. Thank you for listening. Be safe. Bye.